This is my last full day in Syria. The night before, we'd all gone to the beach, and so all of our friends, we all got together and we all celebrated my last night because I had this funny feeling it would be very difficult for me to get back into Syria. <laughs> لا بعد عنه بعد عنه جيري نايم جيري it's very good um, so we all went out there and throughout the whole of my period there 2011 and 2012 I, I was having this battle with myself because the western big you were telling me one thing and all my friends were telling me something else and I kind of knew that at some point I was going to have to make decision to land on one side of the argument or the other. So I sat there on this beach and the sun was rising behind me and just in the distance here is Cyprus which is really the edge of the EU zone and you can see it uh, from, from this point. And I was looking at that thinking I really have to make a decision because uh, my brain was just all over the place. And then this guy is a guy called Yosef who was half Russian half Syrian and he was leaving also. It was like a dual party. And he was going to Russia to fight in the Russian army. I had another friend there who was actually being conscripted, and this was his last weekend before he went into the Syrian army. So there was a lot of kind of talk and conversations you can imagine about Syria and politics and the regime, and the government, the armies and stuff. And one of the things that I'd learned from all of this is that there was never any black and white view. Everybody has a different opinion. I'm sure in this room has a different opinion of Barack Obama and the EU and Greece and the Ukraine, and Russia, and Putin, and to imagine that every single Syrian thinks A or thinks B, when every single American thinks A to Z, then, um, you know, it's, it's a bit disingenuous to imagine that there is just this one point of view. Um, so we left the very, uh, very early in the morning. I'd been awake, uh, awake all night drinking, parking, so around about 6.30, 7 o'clock, I left. Um, I got on the minibus, and and including uh, Yosef and a few other people, we started to share and pass um, our little discs and memory cards and Bluetooth and everything so that we all had each other's photographs. And you need to compare that with some things that Sue like Robert said about having a cassette. She actually mentions in her blog about how she um, had to smuggle out these tapes and she suggests that she had to stick them up her vagina. She doesn't exactly say that, but that's what she suggests. And um, you know, and these tapes are like this, and uh, and I was using like a, a little mini SD card, <laughs> smaller than my thumb, and I'm thinking, well, you know, if I had to stick something up me, I know how big I would like that to be. And she, who's had like 20 years' experience as a journalist, was using these tapes this big, and I was using something smaller than my thumb now. And we were we were sat in a minibus with a hired driver in the middle of an open road that no one knew, and we were like Bluetoothing and exchanging discs and all sorts. But as we were leaving, we could see these huge, big surface-to-air missile launchers. And they were just there, lined up, pointing at the sky, ready and waiting. And these things are big, and I'd never, ever come across any military hardware before going to Syria. I really hadn't. And they are big. They are imposing, they are impressive, they are scary. And when they're lined up, pointing at the sky, that's really scary. When you then add into the factor that they are aiming at an enemy, which is your country, your countrymen, your pilots, that even adds more to it. And, uh, and I remember travelling through on the minibus for the rest of that day thinking, what am I going to do? Do I, do I support my country? Do I support my countrymen? I have members of my family who have been soldiers. Do I support them? Or do I support my friends here in Syria? And what I knew now to be the truth. And this was, oh, it's gone through my brain all the time. It was a really difficult time for me. And then, um, so I go back to my flat, I go to sleep, and then I get this phone call from my friend Basil, this is Basil, who stayed on the beach. And he phoned me up and he said, Gary, you've missed it, you've missed it. And I said, I've missed what, 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 what? And he said, there has been a Turkish plane that flew into Syrian airspace, and these big 
surface to air missile launchers shut the bloody thing down and there was all of these people on the beach and they were all scared and they were all running and he told me the story of this one woman who had a, a young child that was bathing paddling in the sea and she goes out there she picks up the kid and she starts to run back she fell over the kid fell out of her arms so all of these people came and helped her and the baby and everybody just ran and got under cover I've known Basil for years and years, so there's no reason why I wouldn't uh, believe what he was saying. So straight away, I'm onto the BBC saying, hey, we've got eyewitnesses account. There's been a, this is before it was even released as news, before you guys heard about it, I heard about it. I found the BBC, I've got an exclusive eyewitness account of what went on there. Wow, this is going to be great. Oh, sorry, we don't have time to show it. Um, this is what, uh, the top one is what the New York Times said about it, which is Syria shoots down Turkish warplane. Um, which, you know, it doesn't say exactly where the plane was or what it was doing. It was actually violating um, Syrian airspace. Uh, three or four days later, the BBC does say that it may have violated airspace. But don't forget, the BBC had an eyewitness account. They had my phone number. They had my Skype. They had all my details. They could have phoned me up and said, Gary, where was the plane? What did your friends say? Can I talk to them? But they didn't. They decided to go with the speculation of it. And this was really the theme of Western media. If they knew something was true and it was against what they wanted to say, they expressed it as doubt. And if there was anything there that they could say, hey, this is really bad, Assad is bad, Assad is bad, then they would just blaze it out there. And, uh, and that really started to piss me off. I mean, seriously piss me off. So I decided when this happened, that um, I would go onto the side of my friends in Syria and on the side of the truth. I never felt that it was my job to say whether Assad should be in power or not. I'm not a Syrian. But I definitely think I have a say in how my government and how my media tells me what is going on in the world and informs me. Because I make my judgments and my opinions, I used to, on, um, on what they tell me. This is a, an alleged image of Syria. I don't know if you've come across this. It went viral on social media. It is supposed to be a young boy who night after night sleeps between the graves of his dead parents uh, who were killed by the Syrian regime. And it's actually a, a piece of artwork from a uh, photographer from Saudi Arabia. This is a, another image that was put out in the Austrian media. This, uh, this newspaper is a bit of a populist, jingoistic newspaper of the more right-wing side of publications. And they, they put this photograph out in a paper saying that it was a young family who were fleeing the bombings of the Syrian regime. And in fact, what this newspaper did was to take a stock image from the European Press Agency and just Photoshop in a background. This is the apology that they then published, saying, yes, okay, we did, we photoshopped it, we're really sorry, and uh, we won't do it again. This is uh, an image of, allegedly, of the Hula Massacre. It was broadcast by the BBC, put on their website, mentioned on all their news outlets. The guy that actually took this photo came across the image, contacted the BBC, and said, oh, actually, this is of a massacre in 2003, some eight years before, and it was in Iraq. So wrong country, wrong time, still produced by the BBC as being an image that came from Syria. They always have, the BBC and lots of media, have this thing at the bottom saying, we can't verify where this picture had come from or where this news footage had come from, but they still present it. And you'll see that the, the amount of text here, in comparison to the headline text there, gives you an indication of what it is that your eye are going to be drawn to and what they want you to think about it. And again, this is the BBC uh, apologising and acknowledging that they made a mistake with the image. So this is me not making this up. This is actually fake footage, mistaken footage that they will use so that you would get this idea of Syria. How do you come to conclusions on certain things that happen if you're not there to witness them? So I have, I have a really good source of friends. Because I first went there in 2008. I mean, we're now, what, 2015? So that's a good eight years. I've known people who started off. There's a street kid that I know who was 11 years old. I saw a photograph of him a couple of days ago. And he's this tall, white kid now. And I'm like, my God, I got you a little baby when I saw you. 
So I've known these people for years, literally years. From the perspective of us not have, having that connection with other with Syrians, we just like what would you recommend? You know? Don't don't believe me. Hmm? Don't believe me. Don't believe CNN. Don't believe Fox. Don't believe the BBC. Find out for yourself. No, you can have what, five thousand friends on Facebook. Get 5,000 friends from around the world. Seriously, do that. Get 5,000 friends. You have communication access that like two generations ago, they couldn't even dream of having. So get, get 5,000 friends and then just write to the ball and say, what the fuck is going on in that country? <laughs> and then when they tell you, that will give you some idea. Uh, that, that'll be what I would say. Get to know people, get to know their background and their opinion and then take it from them. Um, there is a, uh, a Facebook page called Insight into Syria and I would recommend, please, 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 join this because we have something like five, six hundred Syrian people on this Facebook page. And if you want to know what is going on, send a message. Talk to Syrian people. Talk to people from Libya, from Yemen, from Afghanistan. You can find out yourselves what is going on in the world. You do not need mainstream news media anymore. Anymore. Ignorance is no longer an excuse. You can find out things yourself, and I would strongly urge you to do that. Yesu